In today's video, I'm going to help you set up a home studio. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. I hope you're all doing well. So today's video is going to be all about how you can set up a home studio that you can use for either your personal work or for paid work. There's a lot of advantages uh, out of working out of your own home. Uh, but there are some things that you are going to need, and that's, uh, uh, that's what I'm going to go through today. I'm not going to show you anything that is unnecessary. What I'm going to do is I'm going to split this into two parts. First of all, we'll go through and talk about the things that I think you're going to need in order to get started and to get set up. Um, and the minimum, uh, I, I guess the, the bar is going to be that you want to do paid work for, say, uh, maybe something like what I'm doing, which is headshots or portraits. Okay, so I'm going to give you the minimum for what you need for that if you want to do paid work. And then I'm also going to go into uh, some other things that you may want to consider purchasing or setting up. That is just things that you don't need them, but they are going to make your life a lot easier. Now, mostly I'm going to be talking about gear. So if you want to know more about any of those things, I'm going to put some links in the description. They are affiliate links, but if you click on any of those, you'll be able to find out more about all of those products uh, if you specifically want to know about the stuff that I'm showing you today. And just before we get started, I want to address something here, which is this perceived negative stigma uh, that uh, photographers put on themselves when they say that they work from home, that they have a home studio, as if somehow the work that they produce in a home studio is not going to be as good as the one that you produce in a commercial studio. That's just not true. And it's something that I think us uh, photographers do to ourselves. Um, I've worked in studios and for the last maybe two years, I've just moved in here once COVID hit and I just thought it was easier to work from here and also to cut costs. And the thing is that people seem to be a little bit more relaxed when they walk into my home studio because I can also look after them a little bit better. Um, I've got all my gear here. I'm saving money. And at the end of the day, I've got to tell you, I've never been asked as to, or it's never come up that, oh, you shoot out of a home studio. Uh, you know, I'm not sure about the quality of your photographs. People don't care about that. So just be aware that clients do not care. They go by the quality of your work not where you do your work. So something to just keep in mind before we get started. Okay, let's crack on to uh, the stuff that you need to actually set one of the studios up. Okay, so just before we get started, I'm gonna point out something that's gonna sound pretty obvious, but um, I just, I do wanna make a couple of points about cameras. So my camera of choice is the 1DX Mark II. I've had this camera for a long time. I really like it. I also use the 5D Mark IV, which I'm videoing um, at the moment. But what I wanna say is that you don't need the latest and greatest in order to run a photography business. For years, I did everything that I needed to do on this one body here. This is a 5D Mark II. You can pick these up now really, really cheap. Um, this is about 15 years old. And I would challenge anybody to tell the difference between a photograph taken with this camera and this camera in the scenarios that I shoot, right? So I shoot uh, mostly headshots. And I guarantee you, you probably will not be able to tell the difference between a photo from this camera compared to this camera over here. In fact, that might actually be a video. If you guys are interested, let me know. I'm happy to do a test just to prove this point because a lot of people are under the impression that they need to get a really good camera or that they've got a camera such as this one, but this is not good enough. That's not the case. You can go even cheaper than this, right? It doesn't make any difference. Um, most cameras built or, or developed in the last 15 years are going to be able to do a a good enough job and they're going to do an excellent job in fact um, so you don't need to spend a fortune on your cameras do that at a later stage if you want to but just understand that you do not need to do that and again if you want to make the video if you want me to make the video uh, to show you the output of these two cameras just let me know in the description and uh, and we'll make that video and I'll show you how it doesn't really make a difference which camera you use Okay, so let's talk about backdrops because you are going to need some backdrops. Um, there are a few different options when it comes to backdrops. Number one is if you've got a white wall and your style is that you shoot on a white background, then maybe you don't have to do anything and all you have to do is just use the wall. Uh, I would say just make sure that the wall is actually white. Most white paints are not actually white. Um, and so you just need to make sure that you are getting a pure and neutral white. If not, you might consider painting the wall. If that's an option, then that's something that you could try. For a more flexible uh, approach 
to backdrops, then you can go to the uh, temporary backdrops. So these are primarily made of uh, two materials. Number one, you've got your fabric type materials such as muslin. I have used those in the past. They're not my favorite and because uh, they just take too long to set up and you typically have to treat them before you, uh, before you use them. And what I mean by that is that it doesn't matter which way you store fabric. It, you always are gonna end up with wrinkles and some creases, and you're gonna have to iron those or steam them before you use the backdrop. And it just takes too long. The other thing is that typically, it's hard to set up with just one person, and it does take a while to, uh, to set up. The option that I like is paper. Paper backdrops like the one that you see back here, they uh they just that they, they don't they don't really uh, have the problems that you have with fabric and if you do get a wrinkle or a fold or a crease on the paper all you got to do is just um just cut that piece off and just drag out another bit of paper and you're ready to go so the backdrop that you're seeing back here is one of the uh the, it's the smaller size they typically come in two uh in two sizes so the width and I think it's 1.37 meters wide for the small one, like the one that you're seeing back there. And then there's a much larger one, which I think is somewhere around 2.8 meters. Um, I'll check the numbers and I'll actually put them down the bottom. Now you can get some custom sizes in the middle, but primarily those are the ones that, um, uh, that you're going to find. And just be aware that you can get something in the middle just by buying one of the bigger rolls and then you could just cut them just use a saw that's what i use a fine uh, tooth saw is what you need not the big uh, not the big timber ones and um and if you uh if you use one of those you can then just cut it to size so uh my option again is with the paper backdrops and uh, it also gives you some other flexibilities which we'll talk to um uh, when we start talking about the support systems for these types of backdrops okay so if you decide that you are going to go with a backdrop system like the one that i've got here or a fabric one then you're going to have to figure out a way to put that backdrop up and the most common way is to use an actual backdrop uh, support system uh, what they are is uh, essentially made up of a rod like this one and you've got a couple of light stands that you can use like the one over here and simply what you do is you mount this rod onto there and you lock it into place and then you have another one at the other end now these rods here, they extend, um, they go really, really long. You probably can't see that, let me see. It doesn't even fit in the screen, but it goes really, really wide, so, um, or really long. And so you can fit the widest of paper rolls on this. So this is probably the most common uh, method of putting up a backdrop. The problem with this, of course, is that you're using uh, what is essentially a light stand, as you can see in here. This actually takes up quite a lot of real estate in the studio and so if you're shooting somewhere that's a little bit small then just be aware that this is going to take up quite a bit of space on the floor just because of the legs and uh, it's not so much even how close can you get it onto the wall you're also uh, going to need some um, some room to the side of it as well so you're not going to be able to put this right up into the onto a corner you're going to lose probably about two feet with the space so that may not be the way to go but if you have the space to put this up this is probably the most convenient way of doing it so for myself i prefer to use something called a c-stand and if you don't know what a c-stand is uh, this is a c-stand here which is essentially a heavy duty uh, light stand uh, that can also be used for other things as well and uh, the way that this works is that you've got your normal um, uh, your normal sort of support rod in the middle the legs are a little bit different i'm not sure if you can see that there they're a little bit more sturdy and have a, uh, a more secure uh, stand really. And then you've got this other thing here called a boom arm. And what, how this works is that you just unlock the knuckle and then you end up with this support rod here that you can just lock in there as well. So that's what I use. And let me show you how I set this up. First of all, uh, you'll notice that one of the legs down the bottom is longer than the other. So I'm going to extend this arm here so that it's parallel uh, with this leg here, that's going to give me the most support. So I just place that in there, unlock the knuckle, set up the rod in there, and then the paper roll goes in there. And then I just lift this up to the height that I want to have my stand or my background at. Okay, and then do the second one. And then it's just a matter of rolling down the paper just like this there and uh, I'm pretty much I'm pretty much ready to go 
Now, a couple of other things that you should pick up are clamps like this one over here. And the reason you want to have these, this is just super useful to have in the studio. In this case, uh, when you do pull the paper down, sometimes the weight of the paper will continue just to, to unroll itself just because of the weight. And so you get that sort of effect where the paper will just keep on unrolling. And so for that, you can use something like a clamp in there and it just locks it into place and uh, that problem is sorted. Clamps, I get, I have probably a hundred clamps of different sizes. Uh, these are some of the big ones that you can do and you and they're just handy for all sorts of things. So just get yourself a, a, a few of these and uh, you'll find that you'll actually, that they'll be really, really useful. Go to the hardware store, do not go to a photographic place because you're gonna pay triple the price for them and it's exactly the same thing. Something else that you're gonna need in your studio is get yourself at least a couple of sandbags. These are really good for securing uh, tripods and light stands and things like that so that they don't become uh, a health hazard and another tip is that I've seen people actually buy these full of sand and then pay a fortune for shipping you don't have to just get the empty ones and then go to the beach or fill them with gravel or whatever anything that's heavy and uh, you'll pay a lot less for them there's going to be links uh, in the descriptions to the ones that I like but essentially what you do with these is you put them on legs of light stands typically okay and uh if somebody, it just makes everything more secure if somebody knocks that. And also just working in a small space, I am constantly tripping over light stands. And the last thing that you want is you want, uh, you, you don't want a light sort of falling on top of uh, or you or your client. So uh, a couple of those really worth the money. Okay, so let's talk about light stands for a second. You're gonna need a few of these if you're not gonna go for the window option. Um, what I would say with light stands, there's not really much to say except don't skimp on light stands. You don't have to get the ultra expensive ones. Just don't get the really cheap ones. The last thing you want is your expensive light or whatever uh, come tumbling down and smashing on the floor or worse still on your client because you saved 20 bucks on a light stand. Uh, Manfrotto makes some really good stuff. They're not super expensive and their quality is very, very good. Um, you can get bigger ones and smaller ones. This is a more of a bigger one and they're really easy to use. You just unlock that screw there and then the legs come out and you've got a light stand. Something uh, that, uh, just to keep in mind, when you are opening these, in case you don't know, uh, you see these rods here, you want these to be parallel to the floor. That is where the light stand is going to be uh, with its biggest footprint, which provides uh, the most support at any point in time. So um, light stands, make sure that the light stands that you buy, the knuckle or this little spigot here on the top is fully uh, removable. That is something that I've seen in some of the newer light stands where this doesn't come off. This is really handy when it does come off because uh, there are some things that have built-in spigots, uh, some lights that have built-in spigots, and if you don't have the hole in there, then you can't mount that in there. And also, uh, there's two sizes of screws here, depending on what you want to mount. And so what you do, you do, you could just spin this around and just use either end uh, just to get the, uh, the, the size screw that you need. Uh, but that is uh, pretty much all you need to really know about light stands, there's not much to them. Now, something that I wanted to show you was this system here. This is a multi uh, backdrop holder. And what this is, is something that mounts onto, and this version here mounts onto a light stand. So you would undo these screws here. This would go in here and it would, you just screw it into place and it would be secure. And then uh, you obviously you need two of these. So you have one on here and one on the other side, and then your backdrops go across these three. Uh, you can actually get more than that, but this one's got three. So you can have three different backdrops. Along with this, you get a pulley system uh, that uh, attaches to the light, uh, to the backdrop itself, to the actual paper roll. And it allows you through a, a, a series of pulleys to be able to roll and unroll all the three different uh, paper backdrops independently. This makes it really useful for just getting different looks. And the reason I'm showing you this is because after I installed this, this had a positive impact on my business. I probably increased my sales uh, around 30%. And the reason for that was that I was able to take photographs with the same look, but a different backdrop. So um, the same look with a black backdrop or the same look with either a light gray or a white backdrop. And my clients were buying uh, two versions of essentially the same photograph. And this just makes it practical because it's really just a matter of seconds, probably 
uh, 15, 20 seconds, I can change backdrops very, very quickly. If I didn't have this, then I would have to bring this whole setup down, uh, you know, roll up the paper backdrop manually and then just replace it with another one and, and get it back up there. By that time, sometimes you might lose the connection with your client a little bit. And so with this, uh, you can just keep talking to them while you're, you know, pulling on, on these pulleys and just have a completely different backdrop on, uh, on, on your subject. So if that's something that you do and you like shooting with different color backdrops, then this is something that you may want to consider. Now, if you don't want to use any of those options, let's say that you're on a really tight budget, then you could always try the IKEA option. And that's simply just getting a couple of curtain rod holders, which you mount permanently to your wall. And then you just use either a curtain rod or a broomstick or anything else that you'd like. And you just run that rod through the center of the paper roll and you can use that to mount it. And that works really well. And if you're on a low budget, that might be the way to go. Okay, so let's talk about lights. You have a few options when it comes to lights. Uh, I've got some samples in here, which we'll get to in just a second, because I want to talk about one option that a lot of people just disregard really quickly because it doesn't sound uh, professional. And that is window light. Window light is, I think, the ultimate uh, light. What we do with all of these lights here that cost a lot of money is we are trying to simply emulate a window light most of the time because a window light can be it can be big and, and we can diffuse it so that it's nice and soft on your subject. And a lot of the time, that is what we're trying to do with these sort of lights. So if you do have app, um, access to a window, a big window, uh, don't disregard that as, a, uh, as an option because number one, it doesn't cost you anything. And number two, it's going to be a beautiful, very pleasing light on your subject. The only thing that you need to do typically is you have to diffuse it with something. You can use, um, I mean, in my case, I've even got some curtains, some veil curtains um, that we have put in there. So I just closed, off the, uh, closed them off and I'm ready to go. Or you can use something like diffusion material um, I've done videos in the past on how to uh, diffuse um, light uh, using that type of material and I'll link to those uh, videos in the description. Uh, but window light is a beautiful type of light. So if you can use that and get away with that, then you're miles ahead because number one, you're not going to have to um, you're not going to have to spend a lot of money to get really nice light and it's just going to look beautiful. Now let's assume that you do not have a window that you can use. So you're going to have to use some sort of uh, artificial light and you've got some options in here. Uh, primarily they're going to be divided into uh, two sections. You're going to have what you call continuous light and that is light that is it's just on all the time. So like a, like a light bulb for example. And then you've got uh, what you could refer to as flash. So this is a flash, a speed light over here. This is called a strobe. And essentially this is just a big version of that. It's just that it's much more powerful. Um, now there are some uh, complications now when you're using stuff like this, you need to, first of all, you need to learn how to use this. So it's going to take a little bit of practice, not so much with the continuous light because the continuous light, you're going to see straight away what the effects of the lights are. But with flash, it's only like a fraction of a second and so you're going to take uh, you're going to have to do a little bit of practice to get these right. But what you are going to need if you are going to you, let's have a, a chat about these first. So this is like your strobe and speed light type of um, solutions in here. So this is one made by Ellen Chrome. Um, I've had this for a number of years and this is just a, a speed light, a Canon speed light with the Canon speed light. Um, what you see typically is people put these, um, they mount them on top of their cameras. Uh, like so just up there okay and that is a really uncreative way of using uh, a speed light typically you want to put some diffusing uh, diffusion material on, on it or you want to bounce it off a wall or something like that which uh, will come to diffusion in just a second a little bit a little bit later on now if you're not going to mount this on top of your camera like I showed you before Okay, and uh, what I'm talking about when I say mount it is this. This is what you would normally see uh, or, you know, the, the traditional look of, of a camera. This is very unflattering. It's just it's full on uh, light in front of your face and it looks a little bit like a deer in the headlights sort of look. Um, but if you're going to take this off the camera, then you need to find some way to fire off the flash when you push the shutter button on the on the camera. And for that, you're going to need a trigger. So let me show you a couple of triggers that I've got here. Um, these are some old uh, Fotex ones that I've used uh, for 
probably 10 years now. And the, the way that they work is that you need two of these. So what you would do is you would have one acting as a transmitter and another one acting as a receiver. So when you plug this, let's say this is the, uh, the transmitter, this would plug onto uh, the top of your camera. So you would have that there. And then uh, for a strobe, for example, there's a little plug on the back and uh, you, depending on the type of flash or uh, the type of light that you have, uh, you'll need the, the specific cable. But what you would do is you would then have the receiver like so, okay? And so next time that you push the button in here, the, the transmitter will send a signal to the receiver and then the flash will fire. The reason I like these particular types, which are made by Photix, is that they also have a, um, a hot shoe in there. So what you could do is you could actually mount the flash on the bottom uh, or, or you can mount the flash on, on the on the hot shoe of the trigger the receiver and now you've got exactly the same thing when I push the button on the camera the flash will go off and I like that because then you don't need any cables uh, plugging in from the flash into the the, the, um, the receiver and so forth and then on the bottom there's a little mounting uh, the little mountain screw in there so that you could put this onto a, either a light stand or a, or a tripod or something like that. So that's why I like these ones. Now, these are just, they're pretty, uh, they're just called dumb uh, transmitters because they don't have any features. All they do is that when you push the button, it sends a signal to the, to the receiver and it fires off the flash. There are some smarter ones. Uh, for example, this is an Ellen Chrome trigger and it's made to work with this particular light. Okay, and what this does is it also has some buttons up on the top there. You've got minus and you've got plus and then you've got all these other buttons as well. So this would, just like the other one, it would just fit on top of the camera. And then what would happen is you'd fire and it would just set off the, uh, the flash, just like the other triggers. But if you found that the power of the, of the flash or the, or the strobe wasn't uh, bright enough or it was too bright, then you've got this little buttons here, which allow you to turn the power of the light up or down depending on what you need so that's really kind of handy um, and uh, there are special triggers that you can get for all sorts of uh, all sorts of different lights this is the canon version of the uh, the trigger for that they specifically sell for this uh, particular flash and you can do all sorts of things you can have groups you can have multiple flashes going off um, and turn them on and off and do all sorts of funky stuff personally um, I'd rather just walk up to a light and make any changes that I need to uh, rather than have to spend, you know, six months learning how to use one of these. So um, that's a little bit over-engineered for my taste, but I know a lot of people that can do amazing things uh, with those sort of triggers. So that is the flash uh, side of things. Uh, so the flash and the strobe. So now let's talk a little bit about continuous light. Okay, so this is a sample of continuous light. This is an Aperture 120D. And uh, what it is, is essentially, it's a light that just stays on all the time. Uh, that little yellow, I don't know if you can see that there, the little yellow circle in the middle, that is an LED. It's a super bright LED. It's 120 watts, I believe. And all this does is just, it's a really bright light that stays on all the time. It's not as bright as the flash uh, type. Um, these flash units typically pack a lot more power it's just that they can't uh, sustain that level of, uh, of power for more than a few, you know, hundreds of a second or milliseconds. And so if you, um, if you need a lot of power, then this is the one to go. But if you want something that's a little bit softer and uh, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to just absolutely just blind your subject, then something like this is probably the way to go. Typically, I like these. Um, for my headshots, I use continuous light. Uh, for all of my headshots, in fact, and uh, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, people find flash sometimes a little bit distracting. Um, they don't like it, particularly if you're shooting, um, you might be shooting a little bit quickly and you start getting these pops of light. It just makes people feel a little bit uncomfortable. The other thing that I like is that when I'm using continuous light, because they are a little bit bright, not as bright as that, of course, but because it's sort of in your face um, and it's on all the time, your pupils tend to shrink down a little bit, which shows a little bit more of the eye color. And I like that as well. So that is the other option. Uh, these ones here, like I said, this is my preference, uh, but I still have a use for those. And I, in commercial work, I still use stuff like that. But for my headshots, 
uh, and my portraits, I will use like this. Unless we are doing portraits where the subject is moving uh, quickly. If they're doing some dance moves or they're just flicking their hair and that sort of thing, this is not powerful enough to freeze that because there's not enough light and so the shutter has to be opened up for a, uh, a longer period of time. For that sort of thing, if you want to freeze time, freeze moments, then the flash is the way to go. If you want to go for a softer, gentler sort of approach to uh, taking your photographs, then I would recommend going with something like the continuous lights or do what I do and just have a mixture of both of them. But know that you don't need both. Um, if I was to start off with anything, I would probably start off with something like this. Okay, moving on to the next thing. Uh, this is a simple one. I think you need a computer. Now I'm assuming that if you are doing photography, then you have a computer where you do your editing. I would recommend that, I would highly recommend, let me say, that you have your computer close to you when you are shooting your sessions and that you shoot them tethered. Now for that, you are going to need a computer. Like I said, you probably already have one, but what I would recommend you do is you get a proper tether cable. This one here is made by a company called Tether Tools. I've made videos in the past on how to shoot tethered, uh, which again, I'll link in the description. I am revising those videos for a more optimized uh, version of that video which will be a, a complete guide on how to shoot tethered and that'll be coming up in the next uh, in the next month or so but for the time being just understand that uh, if you are shooting tethered you need to have a proper cable you don't want to have a cable that is you know, going to lose connection to your camera that has happened in the past and it's really irritating because you have to normally reboot the computer and uh, turn off and on the camera. And while you're doing that, your client is just standing there and you sort of lose the vibe a little bit. So I would highly recommend that you shoot tethered. There's loads of really good reasons why you wanna shoot tethered. Uh, number one is you've got this bigger screen. Uh, the, you're gonna see things that you're just gonna miss on your, when you look at the back screen of your camera. Anything that you shoot, uh, if you're almost in focus, it's going to look in focus on a screen of that size. It's just the way that it is. And uh, you're not going to be able to see things like stray hairs or maybe a little bit of uh, uh, lint or stuff on the clothes. If a necklace is not straight, all of that stuff is going to stand out really uh, uh, loads more if you're looking at it on a big screen rather than a small screen. And also you can apply filters already to... Um, to the images to sort of give your client an idea of what something is going to look like. It's very difficult to show or to sit around a camera and go through pictures back and forth when you're making your selections uh, of which ones they want to buy. On a computer, everything is just much, much easier. And um, so for that, you're going to need a computer and you're going to need a tether cable. This is again, tether tools. There'll be a link in the description if you want to have a look at this one. Uh, the reason I like this is because they're really long and also because they're orange. And uh, if you know having cables sort of lying around all over the place can be a bit of a trip hazard. So this just makes it a little bit less likely uh, that you're gonna trip on the cable and bring down your camera and your computer and just have a disaster. The other thing that I would recommend is that you get yourself an external hard drive to shoot your images into if you are shooting tethered. Um, these little Samsung SSDs, they're quite inexpensive and they're really large and they're very, very fast as well. And they don't take up a lot of uh, power as well. So typically when I'm shooting tethered, uh, actually every time that I'm shooting tethered, I'm shooting in an, into an external hard drive because I've run into problems in the past where I'm shooting into the internal hard drive of the laptop and then it just fills up and then I have to go back and be deleting files while my client is waiting. It's just not a professional look. So get yourself a little external hard drive, whether it's one of these or any other type of hard drive, uh, just so that you're not using the internal hard drive on your computer. All right, let's talk about Apple boxes for a second. These are one of those things that people wonder why you should have them. And then once you have them, you wonder, how did you ever do without them? Apple boxes are really useful for all sorts of things. They come in different sizes. This is a full one. This is a half, which is uh, half the width of the full. And then you get the quarter, which again is a quarter of the size of the full. And then there's another size there called a the pancake. These can be a stool. They can be a ladder. It can be a desk. It could be all sorts of different things. The main way that I use them is uh, I use this one here. This is the half one. And uh, when I'm shooting headshots on location, uh, let's say I've got to shoot 20 people, then what I'll do is I'll set up my lights for the tallest person of the group. And then when I get someone that's a little bit shorter, uh, rather than bring the lights down and just having to move everything, then I just give them a box to stand on and I bring my subject up to the levels of the lights. That saves me loads of time. That's just one example of, uh, of how you can get creative using these. Um, it doesn't matter which brand you use, 
or which brand you get. Uh, the thing about an Apple box is that it's a very specific uh, sort of dimension box. So if you get different brands, they should all be exactly the same size. So highly recommend these. They're easy to store as well. You can put this, you can just stack them up on top of each other in a corner. Uh, rather than have to have, say, if you use uh, chairs because you like photographing your, your client uh, sitting down, then uh, rather than storing different types of chairs, uh, I use uh, the boxes and I just get them to sit on a boxes or on one of the boxes. They look kind of cool even when it's in the shot anyway because it looks like a the they are theatrical boxes, so uh, they do sort of fit in with the whole uh, vibe of the of the of a of a photograph uh, session, um, but. It just makes it really, really easy to get something of varying different heights because you can use multiple ones and stack them on each other and, uh, and then you can get the right height uh, to seat your client down. So we've reached the end of the video. There's one more item that I want to show you that is not a piece of photographic equipment, but I think it's critical if you're going to start a photography business. And that's one of these. Um, it is some way to take payment from your clients. This is, this is a little card reader thing made by uh, Square. I'm not affiliated with them. It's just the one that I use. And the reason I use this is because I want to handle all the accounts at the end of the session. Most clients will appreciate that. They don't really want you sending them, uh, emailing them invoices or anything like that, or, or, or PayPal uh, things that they you know have to go into a computer. Most of the time, they're going to want to handle their account then and there. And then it's out of your head as well. And, uh, and they're happy that uh, they've paid for their images and everything's done. So something like this is absolutely critical. And also, if you guys are interested in the way that I, um, I manage my business, or how I make my bookings, and how I do my sales sessions, and how I take payments, and all of that stuff, if you guys are interested in that, please let me know. Normally, this channel is just mostly for uh, technical things and it's about photography. But if you want to learn more about my business and the way that I handle my business and maybe it's something that might be useful to you, definitely let me know in the comment section below and I'll make a video where we can go into, uh, into a, little more, a little more detail uh, on the business side of photography. So that's it for this video. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you did, uh, I would ask you to please click the like button. It makes a massive difference to me. That's how I know that you like my videos. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, consider doing so. I make videos like this uh, all the time to help you with your photography. So if you don't want to miss out on any of those, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you'll be notified when I upload a new video. And if you've got any questions on anything that I talked about today, just leave them in the comment section below. Uh, that's the best uh, place to get in touch with me. Otherwise, you can reach me through all of the usual social media platforms and you're going to find all the links in the description below. Again, please don't forget to like this video. I want to thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Thank you.